And uh, we're coming now, to, in many ways, to the climax. Uh, we have followed Jesus' ministry, and uh, we've seen how he took his word all across Israel, right from Galilee up north, uh, Samaria in between, and in Judea, and now he's at Jerusalem. And as we know, we are in the Passion Week. Uh, we are no more than four or three or four days uh, before the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be crucified. Now, unlike humans who don't know this, the Lord knew what was happening. So I think it's something we need to be mindful when we're reading. He's fully aware. He's fully aware of what then is going to come next. He's, I mean, uh, I doubt any of us would be able to go through knowing, being fully aware of all that is in store as we're coming step by step closer to what, uh, you know, how the dread he felt uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane before, on the night before his crucifixion. Uh, as we know, it's not about pain. It's uh, not about... Uh, humil uh, the humiliation he's going to face, but it's about the fact that he's going to become sin for us. He's having to carry the sin, having, uh, in a sense, being literally separated from God. Uh, and that is what, and he's heading towards that. So the Lord Jesus, and that the few weeks now that we're going to be following is we're going to be following the Lord Jesus's what he's teaching, what he's telling, what he's doing at that time in his life when he was there. So uh, what we see here uh, in uh, chapter 11, verses 12 to 25, is the account about the fig tree and the temple, uh, which, Mar which is unique in many ways in Mark, the way Mark uh, puts it. Uh, for example, uh, in Luke's gospel, uh, there's only the account about the temple. There's no reference to the tree. Uh, in Matthew's account, there is the instance about the temple followed by the account of the tree. Whereas Mark's gospel weaves them together and that juxtaposition makes the parable or the illustration that he's making very clear. And that is what we're going to follow today. So let's... Uh, I'll read verses 12 to 25, uh, and then we'll uh, go through this. You can follow with me uh, in your Bibles or on the screen. And uh, there, there is a structure to this portion, but uh, let's first go through, read through once, and then we'll look at that. So Mark chapter 11, verses 12 to 25. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. For they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when the evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt it in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. So, 
Uh, sorry, I wasn't, uh, but okay, let's, the structure of what we are studying, uh, these verses, the simplest way I could come, which an, uh, may, may or may not align with many other versions of studies, but this is how I found this easiest to comprehend, is there was an, out, there's an illustration about the tree, there is an illustration, uh, a practical thing of what happens at the temple, and then there is a, a little teaching from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's essentially the simplest way to see this. So the, uh, you have first uh, the instance of the tree, which is the, the first up to verses 12 to 14. Then we have the account of at the temple, which is from verses uh, 15 to verses 19. And then from verses 20 onwards till the end, verses 25, is Jesus' teaching about uh, essentially the tree. Uh, to the disciples. And the account is primarily a parable, a sobering parable, because this is the only miracle of destruction in the Gospels, uh, right? This is a negative story. This is not a happy story. Uh, this is, uh, can be clear, so, but it is a miracle because it's against natural law, so uh, you can call it, uh, it's hard to classify what Jesus did here. It can be seen as judgment, it can be seen as a curse, uh, it can be seen as a prophetic oracle that comes through very quickly, right? Uh, uh, many preachers have referred this as a parable that's going to come true. So, uh, but as you read it, it's quite clear what it's referring to. And another interesting thing, miracles of judgment and destruction do appear in the Bible. Uh, you have in the Old Testament, all of ex uh, if you look at uh, Exodus, we see Moses uh, doing all these destructive things on the Egyptians. You have the life of Elijah and Elisha. Uh, you see how they do that. Uh, we see Peter coming into the New Testament. You see Peter pronouncing judgment on Ananias and Sapphira. You see uh, Paul striking the blind sorcerer Elimus by Jesus, uh, striking him blind, remember? Uh, so there are a few instances but all the judgments are against people, individuals. This is a little unique. This is against uh, nature or an, or, or an inanimate object, a tree. So th there are some interesting things. There are a lot of extreme reactions to this account as well uh, among people. Uh, but let's study and see what, uh, it's all familiar. I'm sure you've got, studied this many times. Uh, but we'll uh, going through this once more methodically, quickly, and see what uh, uh, the Spirit wants to teach us this morning from this account. So the first thing we look at is uh, verses 12 to 14, which is the account of the barren tree. And it starts off in verse 12 by saying, On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Okay, the following day. What is the following day? Uh, this account is immediately following uh, Palm Sunday, right? You remember? Uh, with, uh, was it Brother Sudhakar last week? That, so we had this account of uh, uh, the triumphal entry. And uh, we saw how Jesus entered Jerusalem. And we saw towards the end that he just sort of stepped in, looked at the temple, and then went back, went away, left Jer Jerusalem. So when... Uh, so the, the general thing is that he, they went to Bethany, and as you can see here, that after spending the night in Bethany, they're coming back to Jerusalem this morning, because that's how Jesus mostly operated. When they, because obviously Jerusalem was bursting at the seams, remember? Uh, this is the time of the festivals. They are, uh, from uh, being a reasonably well-populated city, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of pilgrims who've come in. Uh, so it's not as if it's a place where you can easily find a motel for the night or something. So they would spend the night in Bethany, come back into Jerusalem. So on the following day, so the day after Palm Sunday, uh, or as many preachers say, it's Palm Monday. The day is not very relevant for us. It's the next day. So on the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Now, I think this is one of uh, Mark's 
many references which drives home the humanity of Jesus, right? I, I mean, uh, when you're reading about Jesus, his glory, his miracles, all the wondrous things, and suddenly he says he was hungry. And it's, but that is such an important truth. It is the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was fully human. He had all the human things. For example, uh, and Mark is consistent in his account, right, from chapter 1, where he talks about how he's moved with pity, talking about his compassion, uh, talking about his anger and grief uh, in Mark 3, 5, uh, talking about how he gets tired and needs sleep that we see in, again, Mark chapter 4, how we see his compassion again in Mark chapter 6, and how uh, later uh, in the Garden of, Eden, uh, Garden of Gethsemane we see how the Lord Jesus is grieved and troubled. Uh, just highlighted those portions, but it just drives the truth about the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was God indeed, but he was fully human with all the human weaknesses, all the human limitations, and we can see him facing all of those in his life. And uh, that, that is, uh, the fact that he's not immune is what is again, I guess he, in the author of Hebrews gives us that clear reminder that this is what, uh, why the Lord Jesus can sympathize with our predicaments and our weaknesses. We don't have a God who doesn't know, who doesn't understand. You dare not say to God, God, you don't know what I'm going through. Trust me, he has gone through all and more. So that is the nature of Christ. So the Lord Jesus was hungry uh, because most likely he didn't have time for breakfast. Maybe nobody gave him breakfast. Uh, maybe he spent most of the night praying. We don't know what exactly the account is. But he didn't have a breakfast. Uh, he was hungry and he sees a fig tree in the distance. And now... Uh, Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Now, fig trees generally produce two crops. Uh, from childhood, how many stories, how many variations have you heard about trying to make sense of what was this whole fig tree business? I have heard many. So, try, okay, so the thing to come clearly to come, uh, understand what is happening is there are two crops right, in a fig tree, two times a year when you find trees. The first crop is known as the breba or the breva in Spanish a crop. And this comes in spring. Now what this thing is, is essentially the last year's shoots where the tr fruit had uh, come. Now from those, that same area, a few immature things would spring up. They would never grow to be large fruit. They would never grow to be sweet, uh, beautiful figs. They were literally like little, little clumps. And, uh, and that's why they have a specific name. And if you now go and you go into all the farming of figs, you see a lot of uh, farmers use hybrid ones that don't have breva or bre uh, crop because it's a waste. They're just little things that come and aren't sweet. And they happen in springtime. And uh, as they're coming, leaves are coming. So the leaves have come after that. So it, the main fig tree, the main fig fruits happen in fall, in uh, autumn, in uh, September, October of the year. But in spring, so is where from the leftovers of last year that you get these little brevas frogs. And so what Lord Jesus, because, and that's what, because you're saying, Mark is saying it's not the season for figs. Again, Jesus, so what exactly is happening? What exactly is happening is, yes, this is not the season for figs because that is in October. But Jesus went looking because he saw leaves. Leaves are an indication that the spring has come and therefore these are sprouting something small. So when you look at leaves, you say it is very high, it is highly likely that there are some fruits because the fruit, those little immature fruits come before the leaves. So that explains what has been happening. And so Jesus went looking for early fruit because the leaves indicate a potential of fruit. But as we, he went, he found nothing on it. And looking ahead, uh, as we'll see in the account, essentially 
it is similar to what the Lord Jesus saw in the temple. The leaves were in some form a hypocrisy by the tree. The tree is saying, I have fruit. See, I've got leaves to prove. The temple is saying we are here to worship God, but all it was had turned into a commercial center. So, uh, so it was all an empty pretense of worship that was happening in the temple. And in response, uh, he says in verse 14, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard it. Seems like uh, if we didn't have much context, okay, he's saying, what is he saying? He's saying no one eat fruit. Uh, but it's very simply because when you look at verse 21, you understand that is an explicit curse on the tree. Because uh, Peter in verse 21 comes and says, Rabbi, the tree you cursed. So we know that Jesus saying, may no one eat fruit from you again, is essentially a curse on the tree. Now, by many readers, many accounts, many essays, you'll find that um, people have found this very petty and vindictive uh, about behavior by the Lord Jesus. Uh, the strange behavior and uh, negative reflection uh, literally has led many theologians to say perhaps this is just a legend. And But this is in the word of God. It's clear. It's mentioned. And this is something that the Lord Jesus Christ, who has no sin, has done. This is not about being vindictive. This is not being petty. It's not in a mood of bad temper like any of us would react. But this is the Lord Jesus Christ intentionally acting out a parable symbolizing the unfruitfulness of not just the tree, but through the tree he's showing about the state of Israel, the nation, and he's talking about the coming judgment. Uh, it is with the tree, it happened the next day. With Israel, that they had 40, <coughs> close to 40 years, right? 70 AD. And so the one question was, what exactly is the fig tree uh, talking about? Because is it the nation? Is it the leaders? Is it the temple? Is it Judaism? Essentially, it is all. It starts with, uh, while it's talking specifically about the leaders and even more specifically the temple, uh, when you look at the whole picture, the destruction of the temple will lead to the destruction of Jerusalem and all Israel will bear the consequences of the actions by the leaders, correct? So it is, the temple signifies everything for this nation. Essentially, in 70 AD, the temple ceased, the nation ceased. Okay, so this is what happened. The Lord Jesus went, saw no leaves, saw the tree, cursed the tree. And then they continued. They were traveling from Bethany to the Jerusalem. So let's come to the second part of the narrative, the second, which is the barren temple, as we say. And we'll work our way through this uh, few verses at a time. Verses 15 to 16 tells us they came to Jerusalem. He entered the temple and he began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. Now the temple in Jerusalem, we've seen so many pictures. Let me show you one more. And this is the general image we have, right, of the temple, that it's a large structure. But this image is not the complete temple. This is temple, yes, but it doesn't cover the entire area, because now you see this part. Now look, this is just a one small portion in the center of the entire temple grounds. Now you see all that area around it, because uh, this was in between is the temple. But all around it, do you see what it says? It's called, that is the Gentiles' courtyard. Those are the temple grounds. Now what we know, now the section in between uh, is the actual temple proper that has the 10 gates, uh, but uh, 10 gates all around it, but only Jews can enter. 
uh, it you know it keeps getting smaller and smaller. Uh, you've got the uh, you've got separate areas, right? Now the gates on all the, uh, on all the gates around the temple, there are these plaques which had signs which said that uh, any gentile entering would be put to death. So you can't enter. That is on strictly for Jews. So the outer area, once you go inside the inner area, is, uh, I think there's a legend somewhere. Oh yeah, there you go. Women's courtyard. Uh, it, so there's the women's courtyard where the Jewish ladies could go. Uh, then there's the court of Israel, which is only men can go. Uh, the innermost courtyard is uh, referred to as the court for priests, where only priests can go. So there are these little, smaller, smaller, smaller enclosures, right? So, but the huge outer enclosure is the courtyard for Gentiles. Now, this is huge. It was half a kilometer long, 500 meters, and 300 meters wide. So that is the huge Herod's temple that was built. Now, unfortunately, the high priests, uh, uh, specifically Annas, and uh, I guess to some extent, uh, a lot of other people to try and help with what was happening there, uh, turned the Gentiles courtyard into a market. Now, previously, if you wanted to buy animals for sacrifice, you need animals. Uh, you need to pay your temple tax. Uh, uh, every Jew uh, had to pay a tax. Every adult Jew had to pay a tax, right? So uh, had to pay the temple tax. Now, you needed money. They wouldn't uh, accept any money. You had to pay. They would only accept uh, a specific coin. I'm trying to figure where I can. The Tyrian shekel. Half a shekel was the payment. The Tyrian shekel, because of its purity, because its consistent weight, was the only accepted form of temple tax at the temple. So you would come with a US dollar or whatever. They wouldn't accept that. You need a Tyrian shekel. So you had to exchange it, and that would be a service. You'd have money change. Uh, it's like foreign exchange here in the present days, right? And uh, you need an animal to pay for the, uh, for the sacrifice, something that meets temple standards. You might get your own animal. Uh, but the priests won't get any commission on that. So the priest will say, nah, we don't think, not acceptable. So then you go to the, and the priest will say, you can buy it from the temple. They'll give you acceptable ones. Like, remember passport photographs? They say, not acceptable. You get it done at our office. We've, it's there. It's, all, it's always been the same thing. So something that you'd pay, uh, which you'd bring from home for free, here you pay 50, 60 times that. You know you're being ripped off. It's like you know how prices in an airport are. You know how prices in specific places are. And, and this is the business. But unfortunately, this is God's presence. This is where you're coming to worship God. And the priests are in on, on it. They are doing it. Uh, the key money changer and the animal sellers in the courtyard was a business run by the high priest's father-in-law, Annas, who was the high priest before him. And it was referred to as Anna's Bazaar. He owned the shops, and they had the monopoly. So it was blatant, it was shocking, it was known, and uh, nobody could question uh, uh, the gross uh, thing that was happening, gross corruption, and all in the name of God. Now, and Jesus walks into this place, right? And what does he do? He entered the temple and he began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold the pigeons. Now, the smallest animal you can offer is pigeons. All the poor people are expected to pay. Uh, that is what you can do. And obviously, even those were inflated and sold at exorbitant prices, so poor people would struggle to even buy that and offer that as a sacrifice. Now, so this father's house has been turned into a commerce center, right? And the, and the, Jesus is described here, it says, uh, he entered the temple, began to drive out. The, uh, the driving out is the same word uses for uh, casting out demons. So it was, he wasn't being nice, he wasn't being 
polite. He was driving them out. Now, it's an amazing display of authority. Can you imagine one man walking into a huge place, arena, where there's business happening, supposedly rich people there, all that, and that one single person drives out all, this, all these people. And so the display of strength and authority that is coming from Jesus uh, would have been something at that point. And people were amazed when they saw what was happening. And the most importantly, imagine the anger of the merchants, uh, the money changers, money was being thrown away, uh, the people selling the animals as the birds are being driven away. And not only that, verse 16 says, he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. Now, because of its position, the temple you saw, a half a kilometer long, huge thing on the top of the mount. So it was, if you wanted to get into Jerusalem, it was almost being used as a shortcut. You can walk through the temple, right? Enter through one gate, go side, and otherwise walking all around such a huge structure. And so people would walk through. Jesus said, no. Stop all that. And uh, it's... So it's quite you know, what he did there. Uh, now we know from Matthew's account that this is the second time he's uh, doing this. He also did that at the start of his ministry. Now, this is not, the, see, the merchants, uh, while abusing the need, were nonetheless providing a service, right, for the temple. So the, let's not forget that. So people do, did need animals, people did need currency, but the way it first is they were abusing people in this process, and the, it is disrupting worship. And that is the key issue happening here. The temple's function is as a house of prayer, a place where people come to worship God. There is a certain expectancy of how it is as a solemn place, a place of quiet, where you experience the presence of God. You don't come there and all you hear is bleating of animals and market people and selling and exchange rates. That is not, how can you worship God there? Uh, Jesus is trying to basically keep some respect for a sacred place. Now, uh, at least if you're a Jew, you can walk in, get a little away from this. If you're a Gentile, you have nowhere to go. If you're a proselyte uh, and you've come supposedly to worship the God of Israel, you have to stand in between a bunch of animals and worship God. So it became, it's a mockery. And we see Jesus responding very strongly to that. And Mark, verse 17, then says that, and he was teaching them, saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Now, Jesus cites two Old Testament passages to justify what he's doing, his anger and what he has done, his judgment. The main quote is from Isaiah, Isaiah 56, 7, which is uh, this one up on your screen. Uh, and just focus on the key, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And the latter part of the verse uh, is uh, Jeremiah 7, 11, where he's, from where it's taken, my house has become a den of, for robbers. Now, interesting that uh, other gospels don't mention the latter part of for all peoples. Now, that is such a key thing here, because that, that is a, one of the key points. All peoples are people who are not Jews. The only place they had was the court of Gentiles. The court of Gentiles was made uh, uh, literally unusable by what uh, the priests had done. The priests, uh, they were running businesses there. There was no place for people to come. And uh, it's very clear, right? Even right back in Isaiah, uh, it's, it's meant to be a light for the nations of the world. It's where people are meant to come. And Isaiah predicts in the end time, uh, many people shall come, come where? To the temple. Many people is talking about all the nations, people coming and gathering. That's what is going to happen even in the millennium. This, uh, we are going, people are going, all the Gentiles are going to come to the temple. And 
and th that is what God's plan was, though Israel, who were meant to be uh, witness, who were meant to take the light uh, to the world, literally uh, became insular and would not even want to share the privilege with anyone in the world and were looking down at Gentiles. So the temple was not only for Jews, it was for all nations. And their action, and this is what the Lord Jesus is now responding to. And essentially after teaching this, you know, there's one more verse, verse, okay, for some reason I seem to have not put up verse 18 now, because verse 18 is an important verse. The chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. Okay, Mark is talking about two people, priests and scribes. We know the priests, the ruling priests, the chief priests who were managing the affairs of the temple there, and uh, almost the priestly aristocracy of Jerusalem, and of course the scribes, or the experts of the law, the Torah, right? So essentially, see how people have turned against the Lord Jesus, everyone in power. So it is the scribes, the teachers of the Torah, uh, it was the Pharisees, the upper class who were supposedly the very religious upper class. Uh, that is right from the beginning of Mark, we know how the scribes and the Pharisees were fighting with Jesus. Now Jesus comes to Jerusalem, and now that's even the priests. So essentially, all classes of people uh, have turned, the people in power have turned against Jesus and are trying to find a way to get rid of him. But interestingly, as verse 18 says, that uh, all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. So the crowd still wasn't against Jesus. And as we know, know later how they'll be incited. But at this point, it's only these uh, higher class people who are saying our business is being destroyed, our control over this people is being destroyed because they're impressed with him. They're not even listening to us anymore. And they're astonished at his teaching. And we are losing control. We need to do something to get rid of this man. And in the evening, they all headed back. The Lord Jesus headed back. Okay, so... This is the barren temple, as we saw. The chief priest, okay, here you have the verse. So this is the instance that happened. So the first instance was with the tree, where the Lord Jesus Christ cursed the tree. Then he went down to Jerusalem, and uh, we saw him clearing out the temple in anger, in judgment. And essentially, the first reflected in the second, the tree and in the temple. And now we move to the last section, which is the lesson from the fig tree, from verses 20 onwards. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And now, from its roots indicates total destruction, correct? This tree is not sick. The tree is dead. Now, what happened to the temple? Not one stone was left on top of another. So you can see literally a clear reflection that is happening. Yes, the tree may not be a reflection of all of Israel because you know that uh, many, of, quite a few Jews were saved and a remnant of the nation uh, will be restored. But the tree is essentially symbolizing the nation and God's judgment on it for, not, for, for the hypocrisy, for... Uh, essentially the false pretense uh, for not having a true heart in front of God. And Peter remembered, uh, next verse says, Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you've cursed is withered. Peter, as always, as a representative of the disciples, is uh, now, if you go, while this just ends here, in Matthew, you understand Peter in some ways is asking a question. As in, how did this happen? Because Jesus responds to this. And the response is what is verses 22 to 25. The, and it starts off, very interestingly, Jesus answered them, have faith in God. 
Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done to him. For a second, we thought we're talking about a tree and a temple, and uh, we're talking about judgment. What is Jesus talking about here? While that picture is clear, that picture, that parable is done. There was, the Lord Jesus gave a simple parable, showed through the tree, and then his action in Jerusalem, and that was essentially, as far as he was concerned, the cursing done of what he's going to do next. This is in response to Peter's thing saying, how did this happen? Because in Matthew, it's even more stunning because they're standing there and it happens in front of their eyes. Uh, in uh, the account in Matthew, they come from the temple, Jesus curses the fig tree, it withers in front of them, and Peter is astounded, saying, how? Now, this, therefore, is the Lord Jesus Christ explaining about power, how, how such divine power can be accessed. So, so he turns this now to a uh, tree, uh, using the trees, uh, what happened to the tree as a lesson on Faith and prayer, right? Uh, verses 22, which is a call for faith, is uh, followed in verse 23 by a promise. And all this, these few verses are repeated all over the New Testament. This is a simple truth that we all have heard in so many sermons, so many exhortations. Uh, we are told to have faith. Uh, and, uh, for example, uh, Start the simple exhortation, have faith. And then the promise is, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Now, look at uh, the parallel in Matthew 17, 20, uh, where Jesus talks about uh, having little faith, talking about a grain of mustard seed. Again, he's refer, there's a reference to a mountain, right? Now, in another one, it's about a mulberry tree in Luke 17, 6. A uh, mulberry tree being uh, uprooted and planted. And after the Gospels, you go into the epistles, you see Paul talking about the same things. If I have all faith, so as to remove mountains. So it is not that the biblical time people were busy moving mountains. It was purely language, idiomatic expression back then. Uh, because moving mountains was, cons was just a way of expressing dealing with big problems. That's all. Uh, but uh, there is no account of any mountain being moved in the Bible ever. So moving mountains is talking about facing unsurmountable difficulties and dealing with them. And the next thing Jesus talks about in verse 3 is that not only should you have uh, faith, but you should not doubt, which is talking about what James exhorts us later in his epistle as well. Uh, let him ask in faith with no doubting. Now, we come to my verse 24, which says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, it will be yours. Uh, now, if you pray with Jesus, uh, Jesus is saying, if you pray with faith, you will have what you ask for, which is something that he's been going on and on, uh, which is about ask, seek, knock. There's so many lessons the Lord Jesus gave his disciples about persistent asking, approaching the throne of grace with your requests. And, and then from a lesson from faith and prayer, we are now move, Jesus quickly moves to prayer and forgiveness which might not seem like the natural connection, but Jesus says this is a very important connection for you to make. Whenever you stand praying, forgive, uh, you sta uh, stand, because back then praying was most often done while you're standing, uh, not like kneeling as we most often do now. Whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. Now, our failure to forgive others will not only affect our relationship with them, 
but it now affects our relationship with God. So that should be a very important thing for you and I to be mindful of. So forgiving others uh, is a prerequisite for forgiveness from your Father in heaven. And that's there in the Lord's model prayer, right? Uh, uh, the Lord's prayer, the disciples' prayer, or whatever you refer to. Forgive our debtors, so uh, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And uh, then pretty much after that, in Matthew 6 again, uh, after the prayer, verse 14, the Lord again explains that saying, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now, a simple instruction, a simple truth, a simple thing on what we are to do. Uh, then we, verse 26, unfortunately, doesn't exist in uh, um, my Bible, the ESV. Uh, I think in, in ASB it exists, but again, as a specific thing. Because most uh, reliable and old, uh, authentic versions, it doesn't exist. Uh, unfortunately, it is believed that some copyist uh, decided to add Ma Matthew chapter uh, 14, verse 16. Uh, so, which is, is, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So, they pretty much took that part and copied it here into verse 26. That's why most Bibles will not have verse 26. So, brothers, so let me quickly talk about, uh, so what we've seen this little instance, we've seen how the Lord Jesus with his disciples was walking to the Jerusalem, saw a fig tree which had leaves but no tree fruit and cursed it, went to the temple and a place where there was a pretense of worship but there was no genuine heart which had turned into a, 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 literally a farce a commercial venture, he pretty much drove people away from that. And then he gave an important lesson on prayer. So as uh, Brother Lawrence was saying, what is the application for you? Uh, yes, these truths in many ways uh, can depend on what you want to, uh, how the Spirit speaks to you and what you want to glean from this important truth. But I can nonetheless give you a couple of pointers. The first thing is about bearing fruit, right? Uh, that's not, uh, Jesus' action in the temple were both a symbolic cleansing and a pronouncement of destruction to come. The fig tree's problem is that it wasn't bearing fruit. And this, is the prob this was the same problem with Israel and its leaders, right? Uh, the bearing fruit has a direct application to you, me, and our church. Correct? That's not hard. That's not a stretch. That's not something you have to spend a lot of time on your knees in introspection to understand. Jesus is not impressed with hypocrisy, with a show of righteousness, with nothing to support what you're doing. Uh, Jesus repeatedly gave us parables about good stewardship, uh, to be faithful, to use the gifts that were, have been given to you and for the call you have been given. You have the great commission. You have about the love you are to show. You are about how you are considered to live. There is no shortage of the standards we are expected to live by. And there is also a solemn warning. If you're a child of God, your eternity to some extent is taken care of, brothers and sisters, but there's plenty much more at stake, how you can choose to live now. And that is about bearing fruit. Do you want to be just a show with lots of leaves and no fruit? Or do you want to be a fruitful tree? Second application is about prayer. Now, uh, he did. The Lord Jesus turns the fig tree into a powerful lesson of faith, prayer, and forgiveness, uh, which is a common refrain throughout the New Testament. God answers prayer. Uh, whatever we ask, we will receive. But please do not mistake this. This is not a license. Uh, this is not, uh, what is it, some claimant thing that, uh, which again turns the whole thing into uh, 
uh, all prosperity, all about success, all you have to do is ask because that is what it says here, right? No, it doesn't exactly say that. There are many qualifications which are also explicit in the word of God, which we choose to skim away from. Uh, what are some of them? So I thought I'll just put a couple, just as a reminder. We know this, but we need to be reminded because we so easily forget which is important. We get discouraged when something, when we are going through hard times and saying, what is happening? The simple thing is firstly to understand your relationship about what prayer is and how prayer should be. The first thing we have to understand that prayer is, has to be according to God's will. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. That is the first thing. Your prayer has to be in the will of God. So the best thing is, don't ever ask for anything which is not God's will. Best thing is change your prayer into asking for God's will to be done in your life. Second thing, ask in the name of Jesus. Now, this is not the postage stamp, just the tail end in Jesus' name. I want a lollipop in Jesus' name. It's not that. It is understanding what praying in the name of Jesus is. It is, say, it is basically saying that in accord with the person and the work of Christ. What does that mean? It means in place of literally Jesus. I'm asking you, because when you say in the name of someone, do this. So you're saying, I'm this, literally this one is doing it. So you're saying Jesus is asking you. So is your prayer when you end what explicitly what Jesus would ask? And that's what, so let, let us be thought, let us stop and think a second next time we add the in Jesus name thing. Uh, and lastly, if you ask me anything, uh, that's the reference, uh, asking in Jesus' name, John 14, 13, 14. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And the last one is ask in obedience. What does that mean? Uh, from this little application, what we saw is that uh, it is talking about having forgiven others the same way God has forgiven us. It is about leading a life of obedience. You can't live how you choose and then expect to go into the presence of God and give a, come up with a wish list. It doesn't work that way, right? So this is uh, John 3, 21 and 22. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. So we can't forget keeping his commandments. What are the commandments? The commandment, at least for now, was clear. Forgive others. So, let, so just a thought before we go. that uh, Prayer, last thought. Your, our relationship with God, God is not a cosmic genie or a personal assistant for us, right? He's not waiting there to jump and do whatever you want because that you have a wish list. We are his slaves, right? Did we forget that? Our relationship with God is we are his slaves because he has redeemed us from Satan, from sin and death. We owe him our allegiance. So we are his slaves. If you have a need, you can go humbly to his presence. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He will meet. He is our Heavenly Father. He will meet it. Let's get our relationship right. We can't go there and demand <clears throat> things. And let's have that right attitude. And let's examine our lives to see that we are not like a dreaded fig tree but that we are living a life which pleases him, uh, which is not a life of hypocrisy. May God bless his word.